it's recording the whole time. Stop, stop. This is a scissor. And shape. As Palestinian Canadian person. Today, those I say, you can't censor me. I belong to a long line of fighting.
able to express who we are, that we don't want to live in these constrictive identities. That is resistance.
much better than what their vision of liberation looks like. Despite what Pricio would have us believe, it is not rainbow marketing campaigns and the goodwill of multi-billion dollar pro-genocide corporations that will save us, but the strength of our collective power. It is not the militarized police force that will keep us safe, but our own commitments to agitating towards a socialist, towards a communist world. We must continue to deepen our political alliances across organizations that actually serve the interests of queer and trans working class people. We must build power amongst ourselves and quickly because the fight is already at our door. It has already begun. Fascism is here. But this is no reason to despair, my friends, because it is from the crucible of abolitionist, anti-capitalist struggle that we can truly find our pride this and every year. Fuck Corona Pride, fuck the TPS, and fuck the theft of our movement in service of class war. Abolition now, abolition forever. this dying, I'm going to read two poems. So as we lay down, as we die, as we represent the lives of all those Palestinians who have died at the hands of the Israeli regime, I'm going to read two poems. The first is by the poet Summer Farah, a queer Palestinian poet. This is Portrait of Me as Bread Baking in Jerusalem. I was there. I was there. I was always there a ball of dough inflating upon the sage until it fell into warmth. I was there, a breakfast laid out under the olive tree after an early morning harvest. I was there, filled with salty cheese while fish bobbed for watermelons in the icy lake. There, by the church in Egypt, to serve alongside figs, trees, never predicting they were soon to be orphaned. I was there, left on the table next to still warm cups of tea, the shuffle of keys being stowed. I was there, settlers setting fire to land. I was there, trunks falling to soot. I was there, earth mourning the bodied ash. I was there, a people dispossessed. I was always there. I am always here. The first made along riverbanks, grains older than settler, than state, 
than tanks, than borders, than bombs, than British, than empire, and still never leave the hands that make me. This second poem is by June Jordan, Intifada Incantation, poem eight for BBL. I said I loved you and I wanted genocide to stop. I said I loved you and I wanted affirmative action and reaction. I said I loved you and I wanted music out the windows. I said I loved you and I wanted nobody thirst and nobody, nobody cold. I said I loved you and I wanted, I wanted justice under my nose. I said I loved you and I wanted boundaries to disappear. I wanted nobody roll back the trees. I wanted nobody take away daybreak. I wanted nobody freeze all the people on their knees. I wanted you, I wanted your kiss on the skin of my soul. And now you say you love me and I stand despite the trillion treacheries of sand. You say you love me and I hold the longing of the winter in my hand. You say you love me and I commit to friction and the undertaking of the pearl. You say you love me, you say you love me, and I have begun, I begin to believe maybe, maybe you do. I am tasting myself in the mouth of the sun. Thank you. left to soothe your heart 
when you go to sleep at night. I think it's shameful that you're conducting your business on stolen lands and you're continuing to fund genocide both on the lands and in another place and you have absolutely no qualms about that. It, it hurts my heart. It, it rips out my soul. I can't look at my children's faces. And I would think to myself, what would I say if I did nothing? And these people continually walk into the places of unethical investments and corporate colonialism on stolen land. And I'm going to give it to Anne Marie before we also bring words from Dan from Bassy Narrows. Am I cool now? Alright. Alright. So I think I want to take some time today to explain how all of these things that have been manifested by the state is actually white supremacy. It is the white man that is causing all this shit! Mercury has done. And 
and I will end by saying that it's funny that they think that we're not doing enough, we're not, we're not all here, we're not doing things, because we gather in numbers, we have strength in numbers, and if you don't respect our existence, you'll expect our resistance.
wealth is. In Canada, we are spending $45 million every day on policing. And more on the day when police are set to antagonize, surveil, and brutalize peaceful protests against genocide. Of our public transportation, supporting our children by funding schools, libraries, childcare, and physical activity, addressing our housing and homeless crisis, and mitigating poverty for the thousands of families and people in dire straits, including the, the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people in this city, 92% of whom live below the low income cutoff line. and the people and the police are making it worse. They are driving poverty and entrenching racial hierarchies that make liberation movement so difficult to fight. And I want to remind you before I end that even if we were magically to find an additional $2 billion to address the many unmet needs in Toronto, we would still have to defund and abolish the police. They work with the IRS because they share the same purpose. 
We want to see a little bit of the and we know the struggle is connected to other anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist struggles for border, police, and state abolition. For indigenous sovereignty from Palestine to Turtle Island, for fear liberation against, against resource extraction in the Congo, for climate justice, and so much more. The war in Sudan is between two factions of a military regime that grabbed power in October of 2021. This is a counter-revolutionary war that is attempting to dismantle a powerful popular revolution in 2019 to overthrow the dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir. The backbone of the revolution consisted of major business communities, of which there are 8,000 across the country, but also independent farmer and labor unions, youth and student formations, queer and feminist organizers. This revolution showed us that we can dream and fight for a world that is inherently violent, ethno-nationalist, heteropatriarchal, and extractive. As my gut comrades said earlier, on one side of the war in Sudan, we have the right to support forces formerly known as the Dinjali, who were responsible for the genocide in Darfur, who started in 2003, left by General Kennedy and its allied militias, whose leaders control much of the illicit gold trade in the country, which was funneled through the gold markets of the UAE and sold to Russia and other countries. Sudan is the world's largest the world's 12th largest producer of gold, the second in Africa. And the UAE is its main trading partner and is now providing critical military support to the RSF as the group stacks our gold. That's why they have been called to boycott the UAE. The RSF was legitimized by something that was called the Khartoum process in 2014, a process through which the European Union funded the RSF to the tune of $200 million to militarize the border between Sudan and Libya in order to inhibit the migration of East Africans into Europe. The, the EU paid the RSF to externalize its border. The EU legitimized them. European border control quite literally legitimized them. And on the other side of this war, we have the Sudanese armed forces and its allied Islamists led by General Bukhari, who control large sectors of Sudan's economy close to 200 companies, and rubber, livestock, wheat, cement, real estate, and construction, which are in turn backed by Gulf financing and have close ties to Egypt's CC. Ukraine and Iran recently started supporting the army of Egypt in an attempt to challenge the power and wealth of UAE and Russia are accumulating for this war. The RSF and SLF both sent troops to fight in Yemen on the Saudi coalition's behalf, thereby expanding their transnational networks. The Saudis and Emirati have invested a combined 27 billion in Sudan's land, real estate, and infrastructure over the last two decades. Here in Canada, there are PR, weapons, manufacturing, and mining companies that are integrated as well. The Montreal based is a national PR firm led by ex Israeli intelligence officer Ali Ben Manashi, represented the RSF after it committed the massacre against the revolutionaries in 2019. I'm saying all this to show that this war is not an internal power struggle or proxy war, it is an internationalized, multi scalar, counter revolutionary war that is meant to protect the interests of the Sunni state and business elites and their international partners and allies. Sudan's population of 45 million is now caught in the middle of the senseless war. All while Sudan's southern borders remain difficult to reach and cross. Sudanese people are dying in the Egyptian desert after spending their life saving days to get smuggled across the border because they are no longer processing visas because Egypt closed its borders to its neighbor Sudan. The EU recently funded the Egyptian government to begin deporting Sudanese refugees. We are hearing stories every day of Sydney refugees in Egypt that are being caught, arrested, and deported. The war has produced the largest internal displacement crisis in the world with over 10 million people, and yet no country has issued free expedited visas for Sydney refugees, including Canada. Canada created a very restrictive and expensive family institution program that was capped at only 3,250, and as we mentioned before, the first refugee that could come through this program will arrive in 2025. 25 million people are now in dire need of food assistance in a country that could easily eat itself. There is a famine, and it is estimated that 2.5 million people will be dead in September. 
19 million children are out of school and the health care system has largely collapsed. As we speak, the city of Sinja in Samara State has been attacked by the RSF and we are hearing interesting reports of the violence by RSF and the fact that fall. We are hearing all these reports as much as we can, however, due to lack of communication infrastructure, communication blackouts, internet blackouts, a major losing of people of their cell phones, it means that we really don't know all the details of what's happening on the ground. In the midst of all of this, the revolution continues in some form. Emergency response teams have emerged across the country during the war, modeled after the resistance committees which led the revolution. In the face of a largely absent international aid community and state, they are leading food and medicine distribution, organizing communal kitchens, driving ambulances, coordinating evacuations, setting up ad hoc emergency clinics and new crisis centers, converting defense schools into shelters, repairing and restoring public services, retrieving and burying dead bodies, organizing activities and learning for children. And many, and many are led by young organizers who are being targeted, sexually assaulted, harassed, and imprisoned by both war and factions, and being killed. If you would like to support the emergency response teams and the on the ground grassroots mutual aid efforts, I urge you to visit us at SudanSolidarity.com or follow us on Instagram at, at Sudan Solidarity Collective. The revolution has shown us that self determination can and does exist in the absence of the state in its current formation. That a world without extractive ethno nationalist, ultra patriarchal, capitalist police, states, and borders, and deadly border reviews is necessary if we are all to survive and thrive. The resistance communities and emergency response teams given by radical politics of mutual aid are creating moments of safety and building community in the midst of unimaginable violence. We must see the threat that these people are to the current global political order. The threat that their will, rage, and doom of justice poses to imperialist and capitalist interests. And that a solidarity we know to be true among the people who are oppressed by the same power must be an active and intentional solidarity so that we may all live in a world where freedom, peace, and justice guide us. for the harm and damage they are causing all over the world, including in Sudan, and, and demand that they keep their hands off Sudan, but also off for Palestine, Congo, Haiti, and so on. We should digress from the idea that humanitarian aid organizations are going to save us, even if we do need them to open the aid corridors, and instead recognize the ways that colonial systems in which they operate are undermining people's ability to care for each other. Instead, we should invest in a transnational solidarity politics that puts trust in the revolutionaries fulfilling the role of the state in its absence and support their anti-colonial, anti-capitalist vision for a free Sudan and the world that would center fear and indigenous and black liberation and climate justice. Thank you for your